Okay. Great. So with that, Dr. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, we've had the pleasure of seeing you on TV um, and following your uh, uh, race for governor a few years back. And you've always done a great job of, again, representing the Muslim community. Um, and really, uh, we wanted to have you on today because you bring such a unique perspective to the discussion around COVID-19, um, having been in the public health field. Uh, and what are you seeing on the ground right now um, in terms of all the discussions that are happening um, about resuming the economy uh, and about potentially ending social distancing? I think we, we're hearing uh, certain things from medical experts and then we're hearing political pundits say um, something almost uh, exactly contradictory. So what is your um, thoughts on everything that's been happening? Yeah, first of all, Jazakumullah khair for uh, hosting me tonight. Really excited to be with you. And uh, to the folks in uh, Oklahoma, I'm sorry that I couldn't uh, be with you earlier uh, or at least last month. Uh, but inshallah, we, um, we hope that we'll, we'll be able to be together uh, later on. And, and, and certainly for the, the sisters and brothers in, in Washington and, and California, or excuse me, in, in Florida. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is the, the $64,000 question. Uh, what do we do um, in the context of uh, getting out of social distancing? Because of course, this is not uh, the best and it's not um, enjoyable and it's, it's really hurting the economy. At the same time, I just want to make clear why we're doing it and why we need to continue to do it uh, until, uh, of course, our, our, our public officials uh, tell us that, that, that we can go back to or at least start resuming uh, different facets of, of daily life. Is that, um, you know, uh, as I think about a pandemic as a, as a, as a fire, right? Imagine you uh, see the, 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 the toast in your toaster starting to smoke, um, and then all of a sudden one of them catches flame, right? You want to put it out immediately. Uh, and if you can't put it out when it's a toaster fire, it might engulf the house. And if you can't put it out in the house, it might take on the neighborhood. Right now we're in a four alarm neighborhood wide fire. And what we had to do to stop the spread uh, be after it became a large fire was, was go into this mass social distancing. You know, had we been able to react fast enough, right, and we had what we needed to do this, um, you could have imagined a circumstance where uh, we were able to take on this fire uh, when it was still in the toaster. What would that have taken? It would have required us to be able to do what's called contact tracing. Contact tracing uh, is the, the, the key workhorse of public health. You identify every single person who is exposed to the disease, uh, and then you, you isolate them, and you want to test them to know whether or not they actually got it or they didn't, and if they test negative, then you you know you can let them uh, back in, in, into society, and you don't have to worry about um, about contact tracing all of their contacts. Uh, we didn't have the testing that we needed. That goes back to you know failures on the part of the CDC and the federal government generally, and because of that, we weren't able to contact trace when it was uh, still a small burden of cases, uh, when it was still a toaster fire, so to speak, um, and then we got to the point where it was a mass inferno. Um, and so in order to be able to stop it, then we needed to put up as many barriers to the spread of disease as possible, because the big risk with COVID-19 was that the number of cases was going to overwhelm our healthcare system. And if it did that, we'd be in a scenario where people would literally have to choose uh, who lives and who dies in the, in the hospital setting. Um, alhamdulillah, gratefully, we're, we're not, we didn't get to the kind of peak that it could have been. People are estimating as high as 2.2 million people dying. Um, but it's still a, a really traumatic peak. People are dying every day, new people getting sick every day. Um, but it looks like we're starting to get to the peak. At this point, we can now have a conversation about saying, okay, well, we, we, did, we did this work of social distancing. Uh, we threw up as many barriers as possible uh, to spreading the disease. All of us went in our homes. We minimized um, the amount of contact that we'd have day to day. What comes next? Well, we're not out of the woods when it comes to contact tracing because the next step literally relies on our ability uh, to trace every single case of COVID-19, um, identify the people who are exposed, test them. And if they were testing positive or before we have a test, uh, make sure that they go into social isolation, trace every single person they came in contact to and so on and so forth. Um, and that is really the next step of this. So what are we looking for? Number one, we're looking for, to, we're looking for a steady decline in the number of cases below the burden, which we can contact trace to based on the personnel and the tests that we have. Two, we're looking to ask what aspects and facets of uh, social interaction can we uh, do safely and, um, and, and how, and how do we make sure that they're safe? Three, do we have the hospital capacity the PPE that we need necessary to make sure that if there's another resurgence, 
that we're ready for it. Um, and then uh, four, um, how do we do this in a way that is, uh, that is, that is um, consistent with where uh, our neighbors and regional economies uh, are, are, are engaging it? And so those are really the big questions that I'm looking for. Um, you saw a plan out of the White House. You've seen you know, governors putting together uh, a set of pacts um, to, to think about these things regionally. Uh, all of this, though, is going to be, can you see a decline in cases that is consistent? Um, can you bring the cases down below a level where you can contact trace every single case? Do you have the testing and the personnel uh, available to be able to contact trace at scale? Um, and uh, what aspects of social interaction are we willing to engage with um, as we come out of socially, distan socially distancing uh, and re-engaging the economy in daily life? So looking at this from a civil rights and advocacy perspective, I know a lot of us have concerns around contact tracing, uh, especially when you have either a large uh, corporations like Google and Apple are going to be doing it, or even worse, um, potentially the federal government doing it. Um, what are those contacts? What, are the, what is that information um, going to be shared with? Um, and especially coming from a community that has been heavily surveilled uh, since 9-11, um, that's something that's top of mind to many of uh, the activists on the ground. What are your thoughts on the discussions that are occurring right now about contact tracing? Yeah, so, um, you know, that, that is a really, really astute question. And I think, you know, coming from the Muslim community, particularly a conversation with, with CARE, um, there's, a, there's a real uh, hesitation to, um, to any system that would uh, allow for the over-collection of data or the long-term storage of data. Because, of course, you know, in our country, we have a long uh, history of, of both claiming um, to protect people's civil liberties, and then oftentimes failing to protect people's civil liberties. Uh, and so um, this has to be done with a, an appropriate balance. Here's my take. I, I think, you know, number one, public health um, does sometimes, especially when you're talking about an infectious disease epidemic, come at the cost of some civil liberties. Obviously, social distancing, you know, you think about the um, uh, pretty, uh, pretty extensive um, powers that governors take on in a moment of emergency like this, to tell us all to stay in our homes, um, you know, potentially uh, to, to fine us for um, engaging in behavior that would be perfectly legal and perfectly within our rights in any other time, but that's entirely to protect the public's health. Um, so in principle, right, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with the, 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 the need and the responsibility to contact trace um, so that we can, we can resume our daily lives, which is really a relinquishing uh, of civil liberties in, 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 other, in other ways. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of going from mass social distancing to precision social distancing. But in order to go from mass social distancing to precision social distancing, the trade-off is how many people's civil liberties do you give back, right, to take a deeper level of civil liberties from certain folks because you're like literally isolating people who have been, uh, been exposed um, and, you know, needing to collect data about who they've come in contact with. The thing that I would like to see is that none of this is done, none of this data um, is stored uh, longer than uh, necessary, that uh, this data ideally is collected at the, the most local level possible, um, rather than aggregating up to, um, to the federal government where it has a higher probability of being misused for other reasons, um, and that the minimal possible data is collected uh, such that the maximal possible uh, public health um, uh, impact can be uh, engaged with, but nothing more, right? Um, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, enabling um, uh, Bluetooth tracking and, and, and some of these other technologies. And I have some real trouble with that because, uh, A, I just don't think it's necessary. I think this can be done, quote unquote, the old fashioned way and do, done well. And B, um, I actually think that the locus of, of the greatest danger in terms of data collection now doesn't actually happen from the federal government, right? There are a lot of folks afraid of uh, telling, telling the federal government, giving them information on a census. Like if you've ever been on the internet, you're giving way more information in real time all the time uh, by just being on the internet than you would ever give to uh, the Census Bureau. And so, um, so I actually think that the biggest danger is really the, the data that we relinquish to major corporations um, and what they might do with it. Because, you know, in some respects, I don't have uh, a, a right to ask a major corporation what it's going to do. It's another private entity in the same way um, that I do claim rights upon my government because uh, I am a citizen um, with rights that are protected. And so uh, in that respect, I do have a lot of issues with um, uh, enabling some of these background tracking technologies because uh, they're really hard to watch um, and really hard to keep, uh, keep accountable. 
Tanya and Adam, I'd love to bring you all in on the discussion. I know Tanya, you're a recovering lawyer like myself. And um, when you hear contact tracing uh, and all of the issues that Dr. Abdul brought up with it, but also the necessity that we're probably gonna be um, facing in the next couple of weeks and months, uh, what are your immediate thoughts? You know, I, you said some key things such as, you know, what's the least restrictive means? How, what's a small amount of time that we can keep data? And if we had a government that was transparent and that was candid about keeping certain things and we knew that the constitution was working the way it's supposed to, um, then, you know, I think all those things you said are correct, right? There's a balance of public safety that we always take into account when we talk about our civil liberties. But, you know, what's alarming about this is the fact that we don't know how the data is going to be used. We, you know, when you talk about do you do this the old fashioned way? Well, that certainly makes us feel a little bit better, but then you bring into this the issues that the Muslim community faces. And a lot of the questions that we hear from like FBI and our clients, right, are who do you know? And so this issue goes straight to the heart of the civil liberties issues that the Muslim community, as long as I've been working with, is facing. The government wants to know who you're connected with and how do we secure that data from getting into the hands of the FBI? Maybe it's fine in the hands of the health department. Uh, but it's a, it, it, how do we know that they're not sharing that data or that it is destroyed when we have a system that's currently broken? And so I yeah. guess those are the first things that come to mind. And, and I completely agree with you that we need to do this in a certain way, because otherwise, will life resume the way it's supposed to from a medical perspective if we can't start narrowing uh, what social distance looks like? And Adam and Dr. Abdul, if we had a functioning uh, Congress where we could pass regulation around this in a timely manner, um, I think that might have alleviated some of the concerns um, for communities, but we know that that's not a reality that we've faced for a while now. Um, what are your thoughts on potential regulations that um, government can come down with to maybe at least ease some of the concerns around this issue? I mean, I, I agree with everything that Tanya said. You know, at, at the end of the day, it's about protecting people's civil liberties while also protecting public health. And, you know, we are no strangers to uh, abuses of, of these civil liberties from government organizations. And I hate to say it, but it's, it's a reality we deal with, whether it's the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, ICE, we have seen it left and right. So yes, we do want to uh, find a way to move past uh, COVID-19 and contact tracing does seem to be a good way to be able to trace it and figure out where it's originating from and how it can be uh, kind of controlled. But at the same time, minority communities, not just Muslims, a lot of minority communities have to know they can trust their government while going about this process. So I think there needs to be some reassurance from the government. And quite honestly, especially on a national level, our government has not really been very reassuring over the last three years, if not even longer for a lot of minority communities. Yeah, and um, I just think it's, it's so frustrating, right? Because you look at who is suffering this disease the worst, uh, it tends to be low-income folks, disproportionately black folks. And, um, and then who is liable to have their data uh, breached and or misused um, the same communities. And so, uh, you know, we've got this, this situation where, you know, in so many ways, the government has made us um, or, or created a level of vulnerability uh, in our communities that we are seeing exploited by this virus. And, you know, this is yet another way, right? When government breaks the trust of its of its uh, residents by uh, exploiting the data that it collects on them, um, then they, it makes them less likely to, to want to give that data up. Um, and, uh, and that makes us all less healthy in the setting of a pandemic where, you know, the only choice we have outside of um, a, uh, a, a, a continuing to socially distance and or having a vaccine, which we're not going to have for a while, um, is contact tracing. Like, it's the only choice. Um, we did a I host a podcast called America Dissected, and we did an episode today called Testing One Two Three. Why uh, we're we're not out of the woods when it comes to testing? Because um, you know you, you either you either prevent this on the upswing, or uh, you lock it down on the downswing. Um, this is where we are now. We didn't prevent it on the upswing, and now we have to lock it down on the downswing. And uh, the only way we do that is by contact tracing, or um, you know maintaining socially distancing. But you know think about all of the folks who. Uh, are so vulnerable economically in this moment to what we're doing with social distancing um, that, you know, this is unsustainable. And so, 
the question becomes like, what do we do? And, 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 and it forces really hard, really problematic choices. I, I do think that um, there are a couple things that could be done uh, to, um, I think, reassure communities uh, by creating a legal backstop um, so that uh, community organizations, folks like you have uh, a requisite to be able to say, look, this is what proper handling of public health data looks like. Um, and um, who gets access to it, when they get access to it, why they get access to it. Uh, these are the, the kinds of backstops that, that can help hold um, you know, what we've seen to be an overzealous, uh, particularly um, uh, immigrant enforcement system, but you know, an overzealous uh, law enforcement generally um, uh, leveraging data in any way they get. And so uh, it is concerning and, and you're right to raise the concern. And you kind of hit two points that I quickly want to follow up with you on. Uh, one is just the government trust and oftentimes uh, many minority communities, uh, impacted communities feeling that, that that trust has been broken. One thing I've heard a lot from our uh, community members is there's so much mixed uh, messaging coming out, uh, even about resuming the economy, um, where you have clusters of governors saying that they're gonna align with one another. Um, and then you have the president going out and encouraging folks to essentially protest uh, social distancing. Um, it seems like, again, the interest of individuals is not being placed at the onset of this issue. And given how we're so connected domestically, uh, how do we make sure that if one state um, decides to start resuming activity um, before we get to the levels of testing that we need, um, that it doesn't impact the rest of us? Yeah. Um, you know, I wish, I wish I could give you a different answer. I wish our president wasn't who he is. Um, uh, but, you know, we're in a circumstance right now where uh, the, the president of the United States um, has shown a willingness to put his interest in a two to three day news cycle over just about anything else. And that's particularly problematic when you're uh, either trying to prevent or respond to uh, a global pandemic. Um, and we've seen that play out in real time. Um, I do know that CARE is a 501c3 uh, organization, so that is not a political opinion. It is just a statement of fact. Um, uh, but, um, but this is the hard part because what this pandemic has shown us is that we are as vulnerable as the most vulnerable. We are as exposed as the most exposed. Um, and we require collective action to actually take this thing on. And so every time anybody decides to cheat on the social distancing, um, it makes us all more exposed. It increases the risk that all of us face. Um, and, you know, to me, this is the, 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 the realization, the moment where we come to appreciate that actually we are really in the same boat together. Um, and we don't really have a choice um, about, we don't really have a choice about uh, whether or not we want to take this on together, even though the politics uh, of the moment um, are, uh, are threatening our collective action. And as activists, oftentimes we try to at least emphasize what you can do at a local level, right? Um, because when it comes to politics, and, and as you know yourself, oftentimes that's where you have the most influence. And we have the uh, holy month of Ramadan coming up, and I know it's a tradition of ours to congregate and gather, but we've seen great leadership um, from national leaders, from local leaders, essentially telling people that, look, social distancing is what's going to get us through this. Uh, so do you have any advice uh, for Muslim leaders throughout the country who may be in states that, again, uh, they get the green light to resume activity? Um, should they go ahead and take that leadership upon themselves and their community just to say, look, even if it's okay in the state of Texas to get back to activity, we know it's not in the best interest of our community here um, and we want to do our part. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I do want to say that this is not an all or nothing thing, just because uh, the elected officials say that it's okay to resume activity doesn't mean that it would be safe necessarily to do so. Um, I will say that the opposite doesn't apply. So if public officials tell you that it is not safe, trust them, it is not safe. Um, uh, but if they tell you that it is safe, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the safest thing to do. And so <clears throat> my, my sense is that, you know, we have a responsibility in our faith to protect human life. And if and when we engage, in activity that may put people in harm's way, we have a real responsibility to it. And uh, our imma are, um, are leaders in that respect and have the responsibility to it. And so I would just say that, you know, this Ramadan is gonna feel and look a lot different than, than other Ramadans in the past. And that's really hard, I think, to swallow. Ramadan is such a time where we come together and uh, we, uh, 
uh, we, we, we reflect on um, you know, our community and what it means to be a part of something bigger, uh, even as um, we do our own uh, ibadah every day um, in the form of, uh, of fasting and prayer. You know, the beautiful thing about prayer, especially congregational prayer, is something you do alone if together. Um, you know, everybody is alone in their prayer. It's not like you're you know, talking to the person next to you. Um, so, but you are with them. You are engaged with them, all oriented to, to something greater than you. Um, but I, I hope that uh, Imma will take the time to really think a little bit about, A, the fact that, that they and the community has never been more important than it is right now. For a lot of people, social distancing means social isolation, and this is hard, especially facing down the potential of, of in effect, having uh, you know, a community less Ramadan. That's really hard. Um, and so thinking about using uh, modern technology like this, you know, I, I, I sometimes reflect however hard this is. Imagine this happened like 30 years ago um, and you didn't have the ability to like look people in the face, talk to hundreds of people at the same time uh, and, and, and engage with each other. So let's make, take advantage of the tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us um, and uh, make sure that we're really trying to um, create even a, an electronic facsimile of what, um, <clears throat> of what Ramadan can be. Uh, and engage each other in that process because we do need each other. We do need our community and we need um, that, that kind of uh, peace and succor that, that only proximity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can have uh, in, a, in a time as holy as Ramadan. And so, um, but I do think we have a responsibility to protect the public health, protect our communities. Um, and you know, from, from, I, I'm not a, 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 an imam or a scholar, but I am a doctor and an epidemiologist. Uh, and I do think that you know, my, my professional opinion on the, in this respect is that um, we should take great care to make sure that if we are uh, engaging in congregational activities that um, we are taking every precaution to make sure that they're not uh, dangerous for folks. And especially g considering um, the, you know, the underlying risk in a lot of our communities, uh, this would be, it would be a terrible outcome to, uh, to, 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 to re-engage too early um, and have community members get sick and have an outbreak in a masjid uh, and, um, and, and, you know, loss of life in our community. We don't want that. That's a never event. Uh, and we need to take extra care to make sure that um, that, that doesn't happen. And so the last question I have for the whole panel, but also for everyone who's listening, um, do you all have any creative ideas that you're going to be engaging with your community or with your family this Ramadan? I know we've started to think about it in my family and how we can um, carve out time at home to potentially watch some lectures online and make sure that we're doing to our, we, um, at our home. But I'm curious to hear what you all have in mind. And for those who are listening, uh, feel free to type away what you're doing um, with your family and your community in the chat box. Very good. Um, in Oklahoma, you know, it's it's a challenging thing for us because, you know, we typically, we have about four or five events, just CARE Oklahoma alone, not to mention all the other community events. And that really, it, it kind of hurts to not be able to do that. I mean, um, you know, we, we had uh, actually planned to host Dr. Abdul um, on March 28th for our 14th annual CARE Oklahoma banquet. And we had to postpone that. Inshallah, we hope to have it later this year. And now we're not going to be able to have any Ramadan events. And I think people are feeling that. I mean, we've had iftars, a uh, growing number of attendees for iftars over the last five, six years. And we've done this iftar with elected officials. And it's just grown to be like this huge celebration because year over year, we've accomplished being able to bring like more and more elected officials. I think last year we had three dozen for the first time ever. We had the mayor of Oklahoma City. We had Congresswoman Kendra Horn, people that never came to uh, Muslim events before in the history of our state come to be with Muslims. And we had like three dozen elected officials. It was like a huge celebration. And so not being able to have those moments is going to be hard. We were actually also supposed to celebrate our 10th annual Ramadan Community Day of Service with the Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma this year. So not having these things hurts. But I think like, like Dr. Abdul said, you know, taking advantage of technology, uh, we hope to still be able to connect with people in this manner, number one. Number two, I think families need to take an extra step. My wife and I, just before uh, I hopped on this webinar, we ordered some Ramadan decorations um, you know, so we could decorate the house. And we typically don't do that because you're going to the masjid, you're going to outside to iftars. But since we're going to be home every day, at least those can be in front of our face to kind of have that, that celebratory mood amongst our own family. And last but not least, I encourage people take advantage of all of the beautiful Facebook events and, and uh, Zoom events and stuff, uh, Imam Sohaib Webb, Sheikh Omar Suleiman, and, and so many others are going to be nightly on 
on Facebook or on other platforms, listen to them. It's free of charge and take advantage of those reminders so that we can, inshallah, uh, uh, boost our, our iman, our faith. And, and last but not least, I'll add this. I was talking to my mother the other day and, you know, we, we came to the conclusion that none of us really have an excuse this Ramadan because for the most part, with exception, uh, like uh, people working in the medical field and such that are still working as hard as ever, if not harder, what excuse do most of us have where we're now working remotely um, and we're not working as many hours to not pick up a copy of the Quran, right? And to read it every day. What excuse do we have to not make some additional prayer? So this is really, I think, a test for us on the flip side. How much are we going to take advantage of this extra time we have in front of us when we're not going to and from the office, we're not sitting in classes at the university to actually dedicate our time to more worship during this month? You know, I, I think you uh, said that beautifully, Adam, you know, when we talk about opportunity, right? And and, it, and I'm just going to acknowledge for a minute, when we talk about opportunities and, um, you know, sacrifice of Ramadan, this community has uh, has always been amazing and one of the most creative uh, communities I have ever worked with in my life. Um, and I know when we use the word opportunity, people are, you know, they're struggling. Some don't have income. Um, but, you know, perspective is going to be so important to our mental health. And I don't know if you can, you can touch on that at all. Um, Dr. Gill, but, you know, we talk about perspective and the idea of Ramadan and sacrifice. You can learn, you can, you can celebrate at home, you can really connect, you know, for CARE Florida, we're trying to host as many events to, to connect with the community, um, to still make sure we're educating those that are from outside the community um, about how beautiful the, the, the religion is, the community is. And so you can be creative now. You can you know, take advantage of so many of these things that we really, like you said, Adam, don't have time. We don't have time on a regular basis to really sit down and think through um, why we do what we do. And this is a great time to reflect, to learn, and to, to, to be together. So I think, you know, again, from Care Florida's perspective, um, I think I'm talking more to my team and each individual person within the Care Florida family more than I would if I was in the office with them, right? Because they are intentionally reaching out. We're intentionally having FaceTime. And that's true for a lot of the community members. Um, you know, Ramadan's a great time to, to reflect, to be together in community. And I think this gives us an opportunity to define what being together means. Um, aren't we together right now on this call? Aren't we talking about the importance of faith and and in, in the most trying of time. So um, I think this, this is hard, it's difficult, it's a challenge, and it's, an, and it's also a great opportunity to do things that we normally wouldn't do. All right, so I wanna kick it over to Adam to really lead the next part of the discussion. But before we do that, I wanna reiterate something that Dr. Abdul said. CARE is a 501c3 organization. When we're talking about elections and candidates, we don't support any. We might talk about the Muslim community as a whole being more pro a certain candidate, but that has nothing to do with where our institution um, has an opinion on a candidate or not. Again, we are a nonpartisan institution. So Adam, take it away. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Dr. Abdul, you know, I, I, we know that you uh, have been a big uh, and strong supporter of Senator Bernie Sanders and his presidential campaign. I believe you uh, acted as a surrogate for, for Bernie. And I was actually having a conversation with some young professionals live on Facebook last night, and it was really hard for them. And I think it's hard for a lot of young people, especially in the minority communities, because for lack of a better term, they were feeling the burn, right? That was their candidate. That was their hope in the future of our country. And now that he has dropped out of the race, um, I really feel like a lot of people are struggling with, with the idea of accepting Vice President Biden as the Democratic nominee. But then on the flip side, for communities that have been attacked by Trump and for communities that feel like or, or for you just Americans in general who feel like Trump has not been the leader that he should have been, especially through this COVID crisis, it's, it's kind of like this, this thing like where I, I don't know what to do. And, and the young professionals on this chat last night were even saying, I don't even know if I want to vote. And I, I think I talked them out of that perspective because I don't think that's a good thing at all. Thank you. But, <laughs> but what is your perspective on, on the 2020 elections and how we should, we should approach them as a minority community here in America? Yeah, let me say three things. Uh, number one, 
our vote should be non-negotiable. You know, that we show up to vote should be non-negotiable because independent of who the candidates are, we have a responsibility to raise our voices, to engage with each other around this, and to make sure that our voice is heard. We don't have a choice otherwise. We have seen what the consequences of bad politics and bad policy has been on our communities. And it's not just uh, civil liberties issues, but it's also things as, as simple as healthcare. Um, and whether or not uh, you can afford to put a decent meal uh, on the table for your family. These are Muslim issues too. Um, and even beyond that, we have a responsibility to protect our neighbors. And so when we see uh, our neighbors challenged, we have a responsibility to step up, right? Racism is a Muslim issue. Sexism is a Muslim issue. Uh, xenophobia, Muslim issue, even if we're not the, on the wrong end of, of, of uh, those terrible um, aspects of society. So uh, vote, no matter what happens, vote. Two, I mean, it's heartbreaking. I, I put my you know, heart and soul for a long time into, uh, into, into, into fighting the good fight. You know, the thing about, uh, about Bernie that I think spoke so clearly to so many of us is that man has integrity. And mm. that kind of integrity you don't see very often in politics. And um, when you have a good person stepping up, uh, it's hard to watch that person not succeed. Mm -hmm. um, especially when he spoke so clearly to so many of the challenges um, that you know, our, our community felt like we were gaslighted into, uh, into, into, into feeling like nobody else saw. Um, mm -hmm. And we saw them play out every day. And uh, here comes this figure in politics um, saying all the things that you've been thinking uh, without hesitation. And, um, and so, you know, I, I'm really grateful uh, to, to Senator Sanders for running. I'm thankful that he stood with me when I ran. I'm thankful to have gotten to know him uh, and to work with him. In fact, you know, right as soon as we're done here, I'm going to jump on a live stream with him. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, really grateful for that. At the same time, though, you know, sometimes I played sports growing up, so I hope that you'll, um, you'll forgive my, my crude sports analogy here. But sometimes you play on offense, right? Mm -hmm. and, you, and, and, and you're shooting to score. Sometimes you got to play on defense. And I think with, um, you know, for a lot of the community, we were playing on offense saying, look, we have an opportunity to, to, uh, to elect Bernie Sanders president. And that's uh, an amazing opportunity because of all the things I just said. Right. And right now, you know, we have an opportunity to prevent Donald Trump from being elected. Um, these are my opinions, not CARES opinions, but, but mm -hmm. these are my opinions. And I think we have an opportunity to prevent the election, the re-election of somebody who uh, has done manifest damage to all of the things we believe in. And it's mm. not just, you know, the, the, the way he uh, vilified and marginalized Muslim Americans, but it's also the way he uh, has gone about governing our country, cutting taxes for the richest um, mm. while cutting services for everyone else, failing to prevent the single greatest pandemic we've seen in over a hundred years. Um, the, the, the fact that, you know, no matter where it is, like the, the government has just been run incompetently. Um, the, these are all, opportunities we have and even if it means that we're not fighting for the big win we want let's fight against the big loss we don't want and so um you know it, it it is it is a matter of our uh responsibility to raise our voices to come out and vote but i also think it's a matter of our responsibilities to uh to to, to stand up and say look we didn't get everything we wanted in this election but let's make sure we don't lose everything we have Beautiful, beautiful. Well said. And, and one thing I always try to remind people is politics is local. And the, the local impact of or the local uh, implications of who is elected will impact what goes on on a national scene. So I had this conversation last night with these young professionals. I told them, look, even if you don't like what you see in the presidential race, there's still a lot that can be done on a local level because there's going to be general elections in November. And if you elect the right people like in Oklahoma, we've got some amazing races on, uh, on the Senate and Congress level for people that will serve us uh, or, or represent us in DC. And that can have a huge positive impact on some of the policies that come out of Washington, DC. So I always try to remind people, think about that as well. Just don't think about the, 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 you know, the top office in our country because there's a lot that goes on uh, you know, below that, right below that, that has an impact on, on policies. And speaking of which, you ran for office in 2018 uh, and, and I was really rooting for you, man. I, I was so excited to hear that. But uh, I have to ask, and I, I don't know if you can share, but, but do you have a future where you see yourself running for office again? Hello, Adam. Uh, you know, I, my, my goal is to be useful in 2020. Um, uh, I'll always, uh, God willing, be fighting for the things that I believe in um, and a more just, equitable, sustainable America where you, it shouldn't matter how you pray or what you look like. Um, that you can aspire to lead. Um, and if that means that I get to run again, great. And if that means that I don't, 
fine. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, I, I've, I'm not running in 2020, I'll just say that much. Um, and what <laughs> happens after that, we'll have to wait and see. Sounds good. Well, what, what would you say? And I'll, I'll, I'll end with this last question before I kick it over to Tanya. But what would you say to your Muslim community, our Muslim community, as far as the importance of running for office? And, and if people are on the fence about it, or maybe they haven't thought about it, like what would be your words of encouragement? Because you experienced it. And I mean, maybe you say do it, or maybe you say, well, it's, it's stressful. I wouldn't recommend it. But what would be your honest uh, feedback on, on running for office and whether or not people should do it, especially as Muslims in America? Yeah, I'll say a couple of things. Number one, um, it is not the only way to serve. And, uh, and it is a really important way to serve. Both mm -hmm. of those things are true. I, I sort of think about it as a pregnancy. Like if, if you're pregnant with it and you feel like you need to do it, right? Like you gotta, you gotta go through with it. Um, and, uh, and I just think that, that there, there are folks feel called to do different things in their lives. And if this mm -hmm. is something you feel called to do, do it. I would also just say though, you know, run it, run into it with eyes wide open. Um, there are a lot of folks who are, you know, will, will jump into politics without a clear plan um, or a clear sense of, of exactly how uh, they want to run and what they want to do. Um, and I would just say that like, you really owe it to yourself and the people who come around you to really have a great sense of like what you're doing it for. Um, I think sometimes we in our society focus too much on the what, like what mm -hmm. is it that you're going to do and uh, too little on the why. And so whenever I hear folks who, you know, who want to run for office, the question I ask them is what do you want to fix? I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you what office you want to hold. That's clear. Right. right? I want to know what you want to do with that office. And so, you know, um, I, I do think, you know, in our faith, we are taught to be very humble about leadership. Uh, and um, there are a lot of folks who see themselves in a position and say, I want to be in that position. And that's not a good reason to run, to be frank. Um, mm. Yes, we need representation. Yes, we need leaders. But our leaders have to do stuff, not just be right. stuff. And, um, and so it's not enough to just say, I want to represent in that office so I can, you know, hold the office. I want folks who are telling me, look, I want to fight for X, Y, and Z issue. And if I found any other way to do it, I would do it. But it seems like this is the one I need um, and I need to fulfill. And that's the reason why you run for office. So um, I just think it, there's, a, there's a real responsibility to be asking the why uh, about what you want to solve, who you want mm -hmm. to serve, um, and why you can't do it in another way. Um, and so you know, I, I just think there's a humility that in our faith we have to bring to everything that we do. Um, and an honesty of intentions. Um, because, you know, the thing about politics is that it does come with a lot of limelight. It comes with a lot of fame. And there are a lot of folks who, uh, who, who really want that. And um, I just think we have a real responsibility to like call ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to our, ourselves, right? Hold our nefs accountable to ourselves uh, and make sure that our intentions are pure and we're doing it for the right reasons. Um, and I think that's really about the why question. Why are you doing this? Why do you want to do this? Who do you want to serve? Rather than what position do you want to occupy? because it's not a, it, it's not a fulfilling way to live your life, first of all. Second of all, mm. um, you know, we believe that in the end, we're going to be judged on what we do. And we don't want to be in a position where, you know, we've done and been, and, you know, in the, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa because our intentions weren't right, uh, that it, it counts for nothing. Beautiful. Dr. Abdul, Beautiful. quick point. Um, and it goes to the, what you were talking about in terms of why do you want to do this? I had so many people reach out to me in the community, devastated that Bernie had dropped out of the race. And what I try to emphasize with them was, why did you love Bernie? Was it because of Medicare for All? Was it because of uh, loan forgiveness? Was it because of a working wage? Was it because he brought humanity to issues like Palestine um, and Kashmir and so many other international issues? And if those were the reasons that you were supporting him, um, why aren't you continuing to do that work and continue to fight for those issues uh, with whoever is running? Um, right. Are there particular topics that you think that uh, we as a community in coalition with other um, faith communities and uh, minority and impacted communities can continue to advocate for in 2020? Yeah, look, I, um, I think we have a responsibility as a community to find our why. And um, there are a lot of whys out there, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, ending mass incarceration that systematically devastates uh, low income black folks in our country, whether it's fighting to make sure that we offer every single person in this country health care um, and that you don't have to pay $1,500 to get access to the insurance you already paid for, um, whether it's the fight to protect our environment and to 
uh, end the addiction that our economy has on a system of energy production that poisons us. Um, these are all fights that I would love to see the Muslim community leading because uh, we have a stake in these fights. And sometimes, you know, the, the, the challenge we have is that um, we wonder why uh, so many folks, you know, don't show up for our fights. And increasingly now it's become on vogue for people to show up for our fights. But um, the big question I want us to be asking is what of their fights have we shown up for, right? Um, because at the end of the day, our responsibility wasn't necessarily just to fight for our own identity. Our responsibility is to fight for justice. And that means fighting with everybody who's on the wrong side of injustice. Um, and I want us as a community not to be so insularly focused. Um, you know, we, have a, we do a great job building leaders for Muslims. I, I want us to be building leaders for humanity. Um, and th that is a real responsibility we have. Um, and it, it, it's not about, you know, our identities. It is about justice because, you know, we are a community um, where we believe in a, in a holy book that says, seek justice. That's the closest thing to seeking consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's got to be our fight. All of these have to be our fights and um, we've got to get real good at showing up for them. Yeah, I, you know, you said something fantastic I want to go to. It actually goes to one of our audience questions about getting re-energized. Regardless of who your candidate was, um, pair, as you, you know, we can't have, we're uh, non, um, nonpartisan, but we have issues, right, that are important to the community as a whole. So when we're talking about getting energized, you know, you talked about taking action. You talked about getting informed and understanding the issues you support. So who, regardless of which candidate you're supporting, if we're not educated on a national level, on a state level, you know, you're getting energized about a person. This is about a system. This is about uh, getting out and voting and getting involved. What action can you take? And you said it beautifully. Why are you taking that action? Why are you involved in the first place? Why did you support, you know, whether that's Bernie or Warren or, you know, one of the Republican candidates, why are you doing it? Um, goes to the issues that we all stand for to fight against injustice. And so when we have individuals talking about how do I get re-energized, how do we get re-energized about the issues? How do we actually understand the issues enough in our communities federally and locally, that we are beyond the political parties and we're talking about the things that matter. So can you speak to that to, the, to answer, you know, um, our, our audience question about how do you get re-energized um, and why does it really, you know, how can we change? How can we yeah. do that system of change? So I think we have a responsibility to reconnect to two things, um, who we serve um, and why we serve. And I'll just say, you know, I, I don't know if you remember um, back when you were in high school, you would take a science class and, you know, some teacher would lecture you about, you know, the way that, uh, that uh, you know, anatomy of a frog uh, is. And then you would, you know, potentially go and dissect the frog. Um, I always found the dissecting the frog part a lot more interesting because it was hands on. It was real. Um, and in some respects, you know, we allow the issues that we fight for to be so, so abstract that we forget the tangible reality that people live in. And that's a function of privilege. And, you know, we also have an idea of that in our faith called ghafla, right? The idea that you forget what you're here to do. And I think the more time we spend connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, what the purpose of this time, this very, very short time that we have here is, and then connecting to people who truly do suffer the challenges that we want to fight for, I think these things become real. And so I'm just saying, don't take the, don't take the lecture course without taking the lab course. And um, I think the lab course is deciding that you're going to go and connect to folks who are living the circumstances that, that you want to be a part of fixing, recognizing what that looks like, feels like, and, 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 and then, you know, doing the work of, uh, of, 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 of spending your time thinking about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you what he gave you and what you owe it. Um, and I think if you do those things, these, these, these fights become a lot more real. Um, and it also forces you to be a lot more pragmatic. Right. A lot of folks are like, well, you know, I'm going to burn your bust. Like he wasn't my guy. I didn't win. I'm going to take my ball and go home. And my point is just like, look, I was the health commissioner for the poorest city in America. Every single day I got to talk to constituents, uh, people who are struggling on the wrong end of poverty and injustice. And I'm not about to go tell them that I'm going to take my ball and go home because my guy didn't win. Right. Like they, they don't, they don't get to do that. Right. Their life stays the same. And so if the fight was about their uh, well-being and justice for those folks, then it doesn't end just because your candidate doesn't win. Um, and I think we have to have a real sense of like who we fight for rather than fighting for these abstracts that can be, you know, tossed for the next abstract, the next good idea, the next good ideology, rather than um, 
people who are struggling, right? You serve them to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Beautiful. Beautifully said. You know, I will just say real quick before, I know Tanya has some questions about your newly released book as we get close to the end of this, but real quick, I will say, you know, it made me realize it's like people who uh, believe in the message of, of, for example, a popular scholar and when something happens with that individual or they lose touch with that individual, it's like their faith sinks. But our faith is not in the individual who's preaching, it's in the religion itself. Much like, as you said, it's not about the candidate, but it's about what is the end goal? What are the values we're pushing forward? So I really appreciate that. And I think we have to keep the, the focus on what we're trying to achieve. It, it was through Bernie we were trying to achieve the end goal. So just because he has dropped out of the race doesn't mean we stopped the fight. But Tanya, uh, let's, let's take the last few minutes and talk about uh, Dr. Abdul El Sayed's new book. Very excited. I got my copy right here and you can check it out. I know it's on Amazon, but please do uh, check it out. Absolutely. I'm actually just shared the link for everybody there who's interested. Um, you know, I know <laughs> that the title of your book, what perfect timing, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, about your book um, and why it's so just p appropriate for the times we're going through. Yeah. Um, so I, I, as you, you know, I'm an epidemiologist and uh my why uh, was always framed by um, visiting my grandmother in Egypt. My grandmother is the wisest, most intelligent person I've ever met. Um, she never got to go to school. And, uh, and whenever I'd be in Egypt, she'd always um, you know, cut me right back down to size. So I was like the, you know, the arrogant cousin from, uh, from America. And so she'd point to one of my cousins and be like, that one's smarter than you. Point to another cousin and be like, that one's taller than you. Point to a third one and be like, that one's better looking than you. Um, and her point was, there's no difference between you and them. The difference is the opportunities that you have. Uh, and those opportunities would always be framed on like, you know, 15 hour plane rides where in 15 hours I'd clear 10 years difference in life expectancy. Here's the crazy thing though. I grew up in Metro Detroit. I could drive 25 minutes and drive 10 years difference in my life expectancy. And that was my why I wanted to solve that. Um, and that led me, you know, to become a doctor and then realize that the health system that I was working in, uh, ultimately had more to do with moving money to very rich people than it did to healing folks who did not have money. Um, and then went into epidemiology as a researcher um, and then got the opportunity to rebuild the health department in the city of Detroit. Um, and that job was, was, was truly fulfilling in a, in a really profound way. But I realized that there was a ceiling that I couldn't broach. And that, that was the ceiling of the political decisions that uh, politicians made. And that's ultimately why I ran for office. And as an epidemiologist, I thought that, you know, I'd left uh, epidemiology behind when I decided to run for office. But the reality was that I was now meeting all of the people I would have been analyzing as data points. Um, and throughout my 18 months traveling across Michigan, I realized that, you know, there really is an epidemic that we're struggling with, and it's an epidemic of insecurity. And what I mean by that is all of the systems that we rely upon to, to deliver us the basic means of a dignified life, a healthcare system, an education system, an economic system, a political system, that those have been devastated by a profit margin that has cut our ability to invest in basic public services, be that our public health infrastructure or, you know, the roads and bridges that we, we, we drive on every day, uh, or an economy that is, um, that is fair and equitable. Uh, and then delivered um, the well-being to the very top. And that's left us fundamentally insecure. And that this epidemic of insecurity has consequences for our politics that self-reinforces. And so in this book, I try uh, and tell my own story. I talk a little bit about what epidemiology is and how it works. Um, and then diagnose this epidemic of insecurity and the kind of empathy politics I think uh, we need to treat it. And it unfortunately is extremely relevant now because um, we're dealing with the consequences of massive disinvestment of our public services. Um, and, you know, the vulnerability of people to a pandemic uh, that itself was preventable. I mean, again, what a timely read right now. And, and, and I look forward to actually uh, reading it. And, you know, since we only have a few minutes, I know you do have to run. I want to kind of ask, you know, with in light of the book, in light of everything we've had conversations about, you know, what's your prescription to what do we do next? You know, what, what do we literally do? Uh, with the information we have yeah. and how do we filter out the information that, you know, really our broken system is feeding us. Yeah. The, the first quote that, um, that you'll see in the book is, a, is a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. Verily, I was only sent to insist upon the best of character. And I think character at its core, at its best, is about reflecting the human experience 
among one another. It's about finding empathy. Um, and, uh, and I think more than anything else, we have a responsibility to connect to ourselves, to connect to our creator, and to connect to um, the people around us and in our own communities. And I think that that mutual connection, if you're able to make yourself a conduit between all of those things, you'll center yourself, you'll find yourself. And the work, the responsibility becomes a lot more clear. Um, and so I, I think that that to me is, is sort of the most centering thing is that if you're despairing right now, if you're frustrated right now, if you're angry right now, if you feel disconnected right now, if you feel sad right now, um, connect, connect to the things that matter most. Connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, connect to other people. Um, and try and be really, really honest with yourself as you make those connections. Um, and I think it becomes, it becomes so much clearer, um, both what you can control and what you can't, what your responsibility is to what you can control, um, and the fact that in the end, all the outcomes are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, I hope that we can find that uh, empathy um, and we can find that proximity to, to, to the divine. And um, that, you know, we have Ramadan coming uh, around the pike. It's only a week away. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to, to purify. And, um, you know, I think a lot of folks are despairing about the fact, and we talked about this, that, you know, Ramadan's happening in the middle of a pandemic. But Ramadan's happening in the middle of a pandemic. And, um, you know, there's always opportunity. Uh, and so, you know, for me, like I look at what my Ramadan was going to be, uh, I would have been all over the country, um, you know, speaking and, and working on the book and uh, trying to help folks raise money for their, um, their nonprofits. And Alhamdulillah, there's barakah and good work in that. But like, that means that there's less time to really reflect on my own life, my own responsibility, my family, my, um, you know, my, my, my own situation. And, um, and so there's real benefit in that. And so I, I just think that like we all, in the end, our job is not to control the circumstances. Our job is to control our own behavior within the circumstances. Um, and always, always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents some silver lining in the cloud, even if it's a little. Uh, and so I hope that we have the opportunity to find it. Beautiful. Beautiful. I know we're getting close to the end. Uh, would you like to share, Dr. Abdul, uh, how people can stay in touch with you? I know you got a website, you're on social media. What's the best ways people can follow you and stay up to date with all the amazing things you're doing? Yep. If you're on, um, if you're on Instagram or Twitter, it's at Abdul Al Sayed, uh, no dash in the EL, uh, after the EL. Uh, and if you're on Facebook, it's uh, just follow our page at Abdul from Michigan. Um, and then our website is abdulalsayed.com. Uh, and I hope folks will reach out. You can you know, email me directly. We, we do answer those emails. Uh, if you have any questions, and then you can check out the book at healingpoliticsbook.com. Um, really grateful for the opportunity to spend time with you. Grateful for the work that you all do, uh, fighting for uh, the most marginalized in our communities. And um, uh, grateful to get to spend an hour with you. And uh, jazakumullah khair. Uh, may Allah put barakah in your work. And uh, for all those who joined us tonight, I hope that um, we've said something meaningful. And if uh, if we were wrong in any way, that's on us. Uh, and I hope that, uh, inshallah, you'll forgive. And we hope that once we get through this as a country um, and as a community, we can have you in Florida, in Oklahoma, Absolutely. in Washington State, um, so My that privilege. the community can interact with you in person, inshallah. Inshallah. My privilege. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.